just ask you to just give us a clap on your chin, just so we can sink the candles. Since I remember myself, I wanted to be an architect. Uh, I grew up in Haifa, in Israel, which is a city amongst the few that still have remnants of Palestinian communities living in there. And as I grew up, I was interested both in, in architectural design, but I could see that the politics towards our Palestinian neighbors was inscribed in architectural form. I could see the way the neighborhoods were organized. I could see the separation. I could see the frontier areas between uh, the Palestinian community and the Jewish majority in Haifa. And I understood already the political significance of architecture. Uh, in 1992, <coughs> I started studying architecture at the Architectural Association in London. Uh, it's a very international school. It's a very experimental school. It has a great tradition of breaking the boundaries of what architecture means, of what can be done with architects. People that graduated from that school went on to open restaurants, uh, went on to be stage designers, script writers, filmmakers. It kind of felt as if architecture is a somehow basic education is spatial creativity. And from that basis, we could travel in different destinations, always carrying with us something very basic, something very architectural, wherever we went with that practice. So I, I managed to go through five years of architectural education at DAA, almost without designing one single building. I've written books, I've written scripts, I've made films, I made photographic installations, I've written fiction and I've written in a film documentary. Um, and I felt very content that that is a way of being an architect in the world. Uh, so that school gave me somehow that kind of um, confidence, I would say, um, to know that architecture is a home. You can go back to it, but you can also travel away from it, taking something with you. You know, architecture is a kind of funny kind of discipline. On the one hand, it has its own vocabulary. It has its own more or less rigid rules. On the other hand, it has to touch. It's coming into contact with many different disciplines. So when an architect builds a building, uh, one has to learn about you know, the environment. One has to learn about services. One has to learn about energy, um, structural engineering. One has to understand digital, digital technology, and one has to understand the physical uh, uh, materials, the new materials that exist. So you're always rubbing against other disciplines. So there's something natural about uh, architecture being a kind of a multidisciplinary practice, because that's part of what it is. Um, architecture is also, people mistake architecture to be about building buildings. Architect architects make drawings. Architects make simulations. Architects provide notations for building to be built. Architects produce drawings. Architects produce ideas. And within those techniques, technologies, and concepts that architecture has, there's a potential, there's greater potential than simply linking them to the built facts. Uh, the kind of simulations that we do, 
the kind of modelings we do, uh, the kind of scenarios we have to imagine when we design buildings. Uh, somehow, always about a relation between the hard facts, walls, doors, streets, stairwells, the syntax of a building and of the city, and the soft movement that's happening within that. There's a relation between the static and the dynamic. You know, some people say they want to go to study architecture because they want to leave something for eternity. First of all, it's bullshit. You know, no building is designed today to last more than uh, a few decades. Uh, but um, architecture is not that. Architecture is the movements and the relations that are enabled by the way you open, close and channel functions, people, movements within that. They are enabled, they are not determined, uh, but they are enabled by the way in which matter is organized across space. So the minute that you understand architecture to be that relation between the event and the physicality between material, static material, and a dynamic ephemeral event, you understand that this relation can move both ways. You can start from an event and ask what kind of architecture it needs. Or you can look at the building and say, what kind of event might have happened here? Or what kind of event that sort of enclosure, that sort of material syntax will enable. And I think that movement across the um, uh, across those, you know, what is the reason and what is the consequence? If you can move back and front in time, you know that uh, architecture is a very good optics to understand different things. The minute that you understand that architecture is about the incident, about the event, about social relations that happen within it, um, it's it enables you to understand social relations and it, understand, it enables you to understand events in a much better way. In fact, in a very unique way. I don't say it's the only way to understand events because different disciplines, journalism, history, sociology, have their own way of describing the world. But we architects understand that relation between the static and the dynamic and that enables us to give insights that other disciplines cannot give. It allows us to understand politics, it allows us to understand culture, it allows us to understand economy and, a, and the way in which economical policy becomes space, becomes the city that we live in a very different way. Therefore, architecture is a kind of um, uh, a knowledge system Architectural intelligence allows us to see the world, allow us to interrogate it, allow us to understand things that other disciplines cannot do. And um, this is something I was trying to do uh, in my work. Uh, I said that I studied at the AA and the, my, the education at the AA is divided into two parts. You do first three years, you take a year out and then you return for the completion for the diploma work, uh, so to speak. After three years, I took my year out working for the Palestinian Ministry uh, of uh, Planning in Ramallah. Uh, as an Israeli, it's obviously forbidden. You're not allowed to cross those borders. Um, but that was uh, a time where one could simply go with a car, uh, with one's car, across the entire space that is now divided by walls and checkpoints, etc. And I offered my architectural skills to the Ministry of Planning, controlled and by the PLO, effectively, by the, to the PLO. And I asked, how can I help? Um, I, I did that because I understood that there is certain responsibility as an architect for the occupation of Palestine. I understood that the um, colonization of Palestine, the apartheid system that was instituted by Israel, there was very architectural project. It was about roads that were serving one community while bypassing another. 
It was by neighborhoods, which were reserved for Jews only, and actually separated and cut apart Palestinian fabric. It was about other infrastructure, uh, such as electricity and water that weren't unequally divided. And I thought that if architecture was responsible for a crime, possibly architectural intelligence can allow us to understand that project better. Uh, indeed, people were writing about the occupation or other aspects of Israeli colonialism uh, from historical perspective, from a journalistic perspective, but architecture allowed me and allowed you know, many others later uh, to understand um, the design dimension of that regime. And um, so when I went to the Palestinian Ministry of Culture, I said, what I could do? Um, at the beginning, they asked me to, you know, just like draft something or fill in, you know, like assistant kind of intern type job. And then I thought, hold on, you Israeli Jew, you could have access to archives, to cadastral centers, to university libraries that we cannot approach. Why don't you go and bring us maps? And I understood something very important that I carry with me all the time, that mapping is power. That mapping the, uh, controlling the terrain is one thing. Controlling the representation of the terrain in maps and drawings is another. And indeed I went, I was like a very low level industrial espionage uh, going into libraries, making photocopies, putting it in the trunk of my car, driving back to Ramallah, giving uh, those uh, maps and plans to my Palestinian colleagues and friends, and understood that this is, this is important. And later on, immediately after I graduated from my architectural degree, I went on to myself map out the crime, the architectural crime of the control of the West Bank and produce a series of maps and in fact have written the first human rights report that claimed that architects are in violation of human rights, that architects are potentially participants in war crimes and crimes against uh, crimes of apartheid, etc. Something that was very unique because it wasn't understood like that. It was understood as if um, human rights are violated by police, by the army, by politicians, not by architects. So at the same point, at the same time, architecture for me was an optics, was a way to understand the world and potentially the crime uh, that the crimes of control, apartheid and colonization. There is a principle of forensic investigation. It's called the Lockhart Principle. And it claims that every contact leaves a trace. Your foot, your shoe is touching the floor somewhere. Even if it's not very visible, a trace is there. Some molecules of your soul are being left there. Uh, because a lot of the crimes that forensic architecture is looking at today happen within cities, happen within buildings, architecture becomes the medium that conserves those traces. On the left, we can see a change in the direction of the road. On the right, a road that widens. We can compare these distinctive details to satellite images and use these to confirm the location of the strike. Then we build a computer model of the building. Based upon the path of destruction, we reconstruct the trajectory of one of the missiles. We locate the room where the missile had exploded inside the building. Parts of the video have been filmed inside that room. A murder happened within a room. Perhaps there's blood splatter on the wall. Perhaps there's footprints. Uh, perhaps um, what, the, what we're looking at is a bomb. Uh, that registers itself in the 
on the concrete facade of the building. Perhaps the car, the getaway car, ran over a garden, leaving some traces within that. Architecture, what we would call the architectural surfaces, become something like photographic surfaces. They record what has happened on it. You need to very carefully look. But the video clip can provide a rare ground level perspective of the strike. We combine the still frames from the video into a single panoramic collage. There are hundreds of small traces on the wall caused by the steel fragments of the blast. We locate and analyse each of these fragments. The fragmentation pattern is less dense in parts, suggesting something may have absorbed the shrapnel before reaching the wall. It is possible that the absence of fragments indicates the places where people were killed. The silhouette of the bodies is inscribed in the room. The walls are like photographs, exposed to the blast like a film is exposed to light. Our work is about care, is about attention, is about developing and augmenting the capacity to notice, to register those traces. But that's not all. Then we need to connect them. We need to connect one trace to the other, to the third, to the fourth, to the fifth, to the sixth. Each trace is registered in a different way, but all of them are recorded on architectural surfaces. Therefore, for a duration of time, the room, the city, the street in which a particular state crime has happened uh, is recorded uh, within that space. Um, and, and we read it backwards. Now, in order to, so in that sense, our work is like a detective, like a kind of like a, the people's CSI, if you like, because forensic architecture never ever takes work from the police or the militaries or any state agencies. We call our work counter forensics, which means we only investigate police forces we investigate the investigators, if you like, particularly and especially in situation where it is the police or the military or the secret service that does two things, both, you know, commit an alleged crime and is in charge of investigating that crime. So that is here the problem. So we would read what happened in the past in a particular location and we would use that case in order to intervene in the future. So, you know, right now we receive about 20 requests for projects. For every one we could respond and take on. There's a lot of work out there. Police forces worldwide um, are continuously violating human rights. But the things that we would take are things that we think could intervene in the future. Are cases where we see their social mobilization around, where there is political agency to communities at the forefront of struggle, and that they could use the information that we provide them in order to seek for political change. So indeed, we look at the past in order to transform the future. With the NSU terror attacks, um, this is a series of murders that happened in Germany in the first decade of the 21st century. Uh, a group of uh, German Nazis uh, were murdering migrants across Germany, uh, each killing in a different city. Um, the police completely mishandled the investigation, suspecting the victims themselves. Uh, of being responsible for them, of being criminals and so on. Uh, the Secret Service, you know, in charge of policing racist violence on a federal level, also completely mishandled the investigation, though they were involved. Um, the, obviously, naturally, the families 
uh, the communities that suffered that sort of repression, both the murders and like the post-murder repression that came after that, uh, needed to undertake an independent investigation. Uh, and so they approached us and they said, could you look at, this, at these cases? And just like we say in many, many, many examples where people come to us, we prefer to take one case, uh, do it in absolute minute details, spent a year, two years, on a few seconds. And out of that incident, out of the microphysics, out of the molecular level of time, pull strings that connect that event to the world that enabled it, to the world of which it is part. Each incident is like a bundle of threads. Threads of institutional racism, threads of brutal type of policing, um, threads of migration, um, etc. And, you know, so, so the, the incident is like a tangle and you need to very carefully untangle those threads and tie them back to the histories uh, of which it is part. Uh, so we wanted to investigate one particular case, one particular murder that happened in a very contained space, in an internet cafe. Uh, on 2006, in April 2006, uh, the Nazi terrorist entered the internet cafe and with a silencer murdered Halit Yozgat, who was sitting at the, at the counter. He was the son of the owner of that cafe. Uh, in that same space, in that same internet cafe, at that very moment uh, was Andreas Stemme, and he was a Secret Service agent in charge of policing neo-Nazis. In 2015, many of the police records documenting this investigation were leaked. Police reports, witness testimonies, computer and phone logs, and site photographs were made public. Amongst these files was a crucial piece of evidence, a police video showing Andreas Temer's reenactment of his visit to the shop. Uh, but immediately after the murder, rather than reporting the murder, rather than trying to stop the murder, rather than intervene, rather than provide self-help, instead of all those things, what Andreas Temer does is leave the internet cafe and drive away, goes somewhere else, uh, and does not report to his superiors, nor to the police, the fact he was there. And we thought, mm, here now, in that 77 square meter, we have an agent of state, we have the migrant community, and we have the Nazis, architecturally disposed in relation to each other within an internet cafe. There was a space that was interesting for us, because it's both a physical and a digital space uh, in which a murder takes place. So we, we actually built a model of that space, one-to-one. -one. We placed every object we knew existed in the Internet Cafe, in that model. Working from leaked photographs of the crime scene, we constructed a digital model of the Internet Cafe. Within those 77 square meters, different actors, the victim, his killers, and the state employee were architecturally disposed in relation to each other. We reduced the model into its most relevant elements and built it as a full-scale installation at the House of World Cultures in Berlin. We looked at the way in which that space registers event, how it would register sound, how it would, what, would, what could you see? What can you hear in it and what could you smell in it? Uh, precisely because the Secret Service agent said he couldn't smell, hear, or see uh, the murder. And we proved him wrong. We proved him completely wrong, as lying. Now, that could be a technical kind of realization. You would say, okay, uh, 
you know, we cast doubt on the testimony of a secret service agent. But this is how counter forensic works. You make a little hole, you drill a little hole in the wall of state politics. You put a spade in it and you try to open the cracks outside of it. And this is why you need strong partners like the People's Tribunal unraveling the NSU complex. Because they asked the political question that our technical analysis allowed them to. So they asked, if he could see, hear, or smell, why did he leave? What kind of policing culture would enable that? What kind of secret service work would do? Is there institutional racism within those organizations that makes exactly those organizations that are responsible for protecting the migrants in society, the weakest and most vulnerable people in society need to be protected by organizations that at best are careless towards uh, the life that at worst have members that are collaborating with Nazi terrorists without that being seeing the light of day. So effectively, here is an example where in 77 square meters you ask questions that have political significance across Germany uh, as a whole and in fact across Europe because, um, because that case was one of the most horrific case of Nazi violence in, in contemporary uh, Europe. And Germany kind of, you know, with its own historical responsibility, with its own position uh, within Europe, uh, both political and economical, um, having allowing that kind of police force to include Nazi perpetrators, to include collaborators uh, with the worst murderers in society, the most dangerous people, is something that cannot be allowed. Uh, and none of us should feel safe in a world like that. This is why it is very important. It's like acupuncture. You take a needle and you try to put maximum pressure at one point and ask those questions. Then you would ask, okay, so where this, this uh, work could be seen? In fact, we were invited to the court uh, in Munich. There was a trial. But trials are only dealing with very limited set of questions. The guilt or innocence of the person charged. The other questions, questions to do with politics, questions to do with culture, questions to do with structural racism, are nothing to do with, with what the court has to, to work in. You need to find counter forensics, therefore, need to find alternative forums in order to tell its story. Indeed, sometimes it's important to tell stories within a legal context, but sometimes it's equally important, if not more important, to set up and or to support other forum. In that case, um, the People's Tribunal was, as it is sound, instituted precisely because of the failure of the judicial system in Germany to account for the nature of that crime. Yeah, in, in legal setting, uh, the category of testimony and evidence belong to completely different worlds. Testimony became to belong to the account of people, to witnesses that can be cross-interrogated and questioned on the stand. Evidence refers to objects, and an object may include videos and other things. And the law wants to keep those categories uniquely distinct. Testimonies have got nothing to do with evidence. Evidence is separate than testimonies. Subject, object, people, things, right? Completely separate. You can be a witness as long as you're alive. If you are dead and your body is being examined, you become an evidence, right? So life, the spirit of life is what turns you into that. And as we're saying in forensic architecture, it's not so easy because we see that through space, 
something that we call situated testimony. Situated testimony is testimony delivered in space. Situated testimony mixes evidence and witnessing people and things. Firstly, we all look at videos now on open source, you know, there's the war in Ukraine. The way we're seeing that war is through the smartphone images of hopefully civilians in Ukraine that are recording with a risk of life, what happens in front of them and uploading that online and we become viewers of those citizen journalists. Uh, we're looking at the evidence, right, at the video. But sometimes something strange happens when you turn the light off the video and you just listen to those videos. And I can tell you from experience, from having seen tens of thousands of those videos, from having worked with them, that Almost all of them include testimony. So when people record something, they speak. Sometimes they narrate what happened. Sometimes they cry. Sometimes they curse. Sometimes they are arguing with the people that they film. All of a sudden we have testimony inside evidence, right? Situated testimony. Uh, also, when you interview witnesses, people that recall or do not recall, people that experienced events, the worst events. People are asked to speak about the worst moments in their lives, usually in front of a group of strangers. Often they have to speak about the worst moments in their lives because they're speaking about an act of violence where they lost a loved one or they themselves were hurt. Uh, in front of adversarial lawyers that want to question them. Um, very often that situation leads to uh, the inability to remember, the inability to speak. And the closer those witnesses get to the core, to the heart of the incident, to the most important element in what they want to say, the more memory plays tricks on them. They remember, they misremember. There are black holes within their testimony or things get distorted. If there were three people, perhaps they will remember 15 because of the trauma they've experienced. Something that was 20 meters long may be remembered as 150 meter long. Something that was relatively low sound would be remembered as, as, as a huge explosion. We know that. We know that the difficulty uh, of recollection with witnesses. Not only do we know that, we know that when witnesses make those errors, quote unquote, quote unquote, in terms of like not describing things as others would have captured them at the time, that the error itself proves that they've experienced something violent. The truth is in the error uh, in, in many ways. And we've developed together with forensic psychologists a system of combining testimony and evidence, of building with witnesses in a very empathetic, very careful, uh, very slow way the spaces where things have happened, without much demand, without asking them about what happened, Sometimes they remember the, the size of a floor tile and we would build a room in prison around the size of a floor tile, uh, such as in the prison of Sednaya in Syria. Sometimes what they remember are the trees uh, and vegetation. So we'd very, very patiently populate the space with model trees and, and vegetation. They'll remember rain, we'll put rain in the model. And as they construct, there is the agency moves from us, the experts, to the witness. They lead the process. They build the scene. They feel satisfied sometimes to have it externalized from their head. 
And very often that evidence building means that lost detail could return. It's a cyclical process. They build a space from memory, but the space that they see help reinforce the memory that they've built. So they build it, you both build from memory and then space builds their memory, if you like. Um, and it is known as a kind of therapeutic technique with um, people that suffered uh, trauma. And we do it very carefully and with um, people that are very close to those being interviewed. And it's a much more precise way of taking accounts of people. Not only does it reveal lost details, that were erased simply because they're too horrible to remember and they return to the witness through the process of building. But uh, they allow a very clear rendering for juries, for the public, uh, of what has taken place. And sometimes they help the witness reorder their thoughts and move on. And many, many people told us that that process actually helped them because sometimes you, you're obsessed with something that is internal to your head and you do not know how to externalize it the minute it is out there. As an architectural model, you can see it, it's outside of your, it's outside of your head. Um, we have noticed that it's in several moments, we've noticed that building a model allowed to bring back details that were lost. One of our witnesses was, um, she was a, she prefers to remain anonymous. She was a survivor of a drone strike in Pakistan, a CIA drone strike that murdered, you know, family members of her within that uh, building that they had in Mir Ali. And we ate here. They were really here. Inside the building was completely white and the increase was just so, Das waren so Streifen halt wegen dem, weil das ja dann aufgeplatzt ist, die ja, Rakete. Ne? Okay. Vieles war auch verbrannt, so viele Stoffstücke und auf dem Boden halt die ganzen Metallsplitter von der Rakete. Uh, she could not reorder the thought. The whole moment of the strike was mixed up in her head, but she wanted to advocate. Again, she wanted to tell her story. And this is what we did. We built her house detail by detail, appliance by appliance. And when she built a fan, um, the fan is simply a fan for making wind, um, we could see that she returns. We could see there was something with that fan that bothered her. At the beginning, it was a ceiling fan. Then she said, no, it wasn't. It was standing here. And then she said, no, it wasn't standing here. It was standing there. And then she moved it there. And then she moved it again. And at one point where she moved the fan to the outside, not to the inside of her room, but to the courtyard, the memory somehow combined, returned to her. And she remembered that she saw human flesh on it. And the minute that she could deal with that particular most horrific sight, the flesh of a family members of you that you confront, on the blades of the fan, the fan holding that traumatic memory, around that fan she could reconstruct the entire time space of that uh, incident. And this is an example of memory, architecture, evidence and testimony, subject and object, somehow combined together through architecture. Architecture stands, precisely as I said at the beginning of our conversation when I said, Architecture is a relation between the physical static object and the dynamic event and processes and relations that happen within that. This is why architecture could provide the link between evidence and testimony.
The event happened in January 2017. Um, a Palestinian Bedouin school teacher, in fact, the deputy head of a school, uh, tried to rescue some objects from his mother's house. Israeli police wanted to demolish the house. They raided this village in the middle of the night. He carefully packed her stuff into his car and drove slowly outside uh, her home. What we know that later happened is that the police shot him to death and that one of the policemen were run over by the car. The Israeli police said that the, this man, Yakub Musa Abul Kian, is a terrorist, that he murdered a policeman and then they had to shoot him. Uh, what witnesses said and what the villagers knew is that he would never do something like that. And we investigated that case throughout years. We returned every time with a different technique. Initially we showed, no, the police sh shot Yakubu Sabulkian first before he ran over the policeman. And very likely after shooting him, he lost control of the vehicle and ran over the police. But evidence is not only about expertise. Building evidence is building the social relations that constitute and support truth claims in the world. We do not want to be expert in the same way like any other bureaucratic experts for courts are. Uh, we do not want to be what is called objective scientists. This does not mean that we distort our evidence. We are very clear that what we find we will make public and we are very ferocious about the detail and the claims that we are making, the truth value. But we have we enter into evidence production because we take a side. We take the side of the victims. Uh, and very often communities at the forefront of struggle know, as I said at the beginning, they knew first that this is impossible, that Yakub Musa Abul Kiyan is a, is, a, is a terrorist. We are simply supporting them. And it is extremely important to socialize the process of evidence making to involve the people that suffer, the communities that suffer the loss in the process of investigation. Many people would say, ah, you know, now your evidence worth nothing because you need to be from the outside. But we don't believe in that. And even if we pay a price, and even if, you know, the lawyers from the other side would like to disqualify it for that, um, that is a price worth paying because what is important for us in a legal process is only the political process that it mobilizes. Uh, in investigating cases of murder, of loss, we want to support the communities that have suffered that, we want to empower them, we want to work with them together. We call this process open verification and therefore when we reenacted the police incident that led to the murder of Yakub Musa Abul Kian, it was absolutely essential to work with his cousins, relatives, the entire village actually reconstructed it. And to tell you the truth, it was what we've learned during that reconstruction. We've learned from those people because they have a situated embodied kind of knowledge that is much more robust than any technical capacity that we could bring uh, into it. Still, our duty of making that is to make every step in our process transparent and clear to show what we do and how we do, and then we can argue with it. We placed actors in the same position as the policemen. Using the same model car, a Toyota Land Cruiser, our driver lifted his right foot from the gas pedal, exactly where Abul Kian's vehicle began to accelerate in the thermal video. We let the vehicle roll freely down the slope, recording its speed and acceleration. Comparing this to the police thermal video, we can confirm it accelerated at a similar rate and moved at the same speed. And frankly, that case was a huge success. We have led to government retraction of the lie that Yakub Musa Abulkayan was a terrorist. Um, we, they ended up, the government ended up with a lot of eggs on their face. 
Uh, the Prime Minister, Bibi Netanyahu, not a man of the left, in fact a radical right leader, apologized to the community, not that that is the end of their trouble, but effectively um, that kind of realization could lead to a political change because it was made by a community. And the contemporary evidentiary mode that we are working on is not one in which there's one person that is the expert and a know-all. Uh, it is about socializing evidence, it's about bringing in multiplicity of disciplines, multiplicity of participants. Each one knows something else and weaving it together. Building a case is like building a piece of architecture. When you build architecture, you need foundation, you need infrastructure, water, electricity. So with a case, you need the evidentiary, you need the, the, the stories of people, you need a kind of a knowledge about the texture and form of things, you need expertise in different type of things, you need the lawyers that take the side, you need the activists, you need the survivors. And together you build an evidentiary structure that as is, needs to be solid because it needs to withstand counterattack. Because the minute that you would put evidence, especially to state crimes, especially to human rights violations, especially when you confront the most powerful institutions in society, you need your structure to stand because they would question each and every move that you have done. And therefore, each video that we show, and, and you would see that in the exhibition, shows you what we know and how we know what we know. Those images, what they show, what they don't show, where we get them, whether we can trust them or not, how we combine multiple videos with multiple models, with multiple testimonies within a single construction. Aesthetics is absolutely crucial in our work. And maybe that's one of the reasons that we show in an art institution. But for us, aesthetics is not to make things beautiful. It's not about beautification. It's not about the value of uh, artwork that we're interested in. We understand the word aesthetics like the ancient Greeks would have understood the word aesthesis, meaning that which lends itself to the senses, that which get registered as a trace uh, within, uh, on a particular surface. Uh, that which get registered by the eyes, by the ears, by your other senses uh, in that way. So sensing is aesthetics. That's the ground base of our understanding of aesthetics. Then, you know, we are a very strange kind of research agency because we're not only architects, they're artists, they're filmmakers, they're lawyers, they're journalists, they're coders, they're, you know, I probably forget one or two disciplines that uh, our team uh, encapsulate. Um, but bringing together, looking at images, producing videos, composing, assembling a case is an aesthetic work. And then, the last part is its presentation. When you present something in court, it's almost like a curatorial act. You have your audience that come at judgment. In a museum, they render judgment. It's a nice, important, interesting piece of work. In the court, they render another kind of judgment. But still, there is a relation between things that you display and a kind of conversation, kind of critical conversation around it. This is why coming from uh, aesthetic traditions, having displayed in exhibition, having worked in, in museum, allow us to understand the legal process as a curatorial one, as arranging the relation between people and things, display and conversation, presentation and judgment. And uh, that is something that is absolutely essential in our work. And now every forensic scientist that you would ask would deny immediately that aesthetic has got anything to do with the scientific process. They would say, no, it's far too serious to bring aesthetics into it. As if aesthetics is some kind of non-serious, almost childlike play that has no responsibility to it. 
Uh, but I think that every lawyer knows how important it is to craft your argument, how important is the performance and conviction is the rhetorics when you present your cases. And for us, that rhetorical fluency that sometimes you admire in a, in a beautiful speech by a lawyer is done in a different way. It is done through image, through sound, through combination, etc. So for us, art institutions do different kind of things in our work. Sometimes when you cannot present a case in court, an art space offers another kind of forum. It allows you to show cases to the public that is difficult uh, because state courts do not always like to stand in judgment over state crime, especially not in the same place where, or the same state uh, where they've been committed. Sometimes a commission from an art institution allows us practically to produce work. And it is very important to know that the Louisiana exhibition has allowed to, has contributed to the production of a piece on Ukraine, on the attack to, on the, on the uh, Russian attack on the Holocaust site of Babinyar. And that work perhaps could not have been if there would not be uh, such support. We worked together with a fabulous group of Ukrainian architect investigators called the Center for Spatial Technology. Uh, they have spent years using very similar techniques to ours to um, reconstruct the Nazi massacre of the Jewish community in Kiev in a valley, inner city valley called Babinyar, which is really much at the center of the city. Uh, where 33,000 uh, Jews were massacred. And later throughout the war, um, many, many more, many thousands more people were massacred, including Soviet prisoners of war, including Roma people, including patients of mental hospital and political prisoners. Uh, and um, now the, that very site was struck by Russian uh, bombardment and we were asking what's the relation between this war and uh, the historical one. Now that's the kind of work that we do. It's both material, it's both reconstructing where the missiles struck on the TV tower, on the gym building next to it, but then asking conceptual historical questions of what's the role of history within this conflict why that conflict is being mobilized by historical references to Nazis, for example, by both sides. Um, the Russians claim that they come to denazify Ukraine. The Ukrainians see themselves as fighting again um, another sort of genocidal campaign by the Russians. And you need to disentangle that very carefully and very precisely. And that work is part of that um, attempt and being done together and in fact in support of a local Ukrainian group is has facilitated the construction of a project an ongoing project that would take complicated cases from within that unprovoked unjustified illegal Russian attack on Ukraine and would disentangle them you know it's more than just simply kind of open source analysis each missile is like a historical probe. Each missile is like a needle that cuts through layers of history and throws up dust that contain historical references within it. There's always a relation between the material and immaterial, between the physical facts and the events and social relations around them. And finally, exhibitions allow us to pause and to look at our own practice. Uh, with critical eyes. And this exhibition in Louisiana effectively allowed us precisely to interrogate and ask about the relation between evidence and testimony, 
to look through, to make a deep dive into our archive and to look at the witnesses, to look at the people that make those evidence files, put them in the foreground uh, and think exactly about that relation between human voice and material evidence. I think we kind of end up leading the lives that the world around us and the challenges that it poses to us um, demand. And I think in many, in another period, I might have wanted to be an architect. In fact, I always keep a sketchbook with architectural plans and there is, there is a passion, there is a desire in me, there's a flame that hasn't been extinguished for, uh, for design, not about being, you know, making, being famous of that or making money from it, etc. It's simply architecture is a passion. Uh, but I think that this particular historical conjuncture, conjuncture, this particular historical conjuncture of being born in Israel at the time that I've been born, uh, the duties that it places on me, the kind of mental, ethical burden, uh, I think it would have been unethical. Uh, to do that. And I think that I found a way to live that, you know, slice of life, slice of history in which, you know, our life is being put uh, in a way that I think is, is the right way. And to put, uh, to actually also within that contribute to expanding what architecture means. It's not an abandonment of architecture. I think that what we claim is that architecture includes also what we do. We do not say replace it. We do not say all architects should do this, but we should say now architecture is slightly bigger uh, than what it was. And it enables young architects and should give them agency and should give them motivation to go out there and to understand that they can be public intellectuals and they can be political agents or activists, and that the toolbox, what they have in their laptops, those software, those things that we studied uh, in almost every architectural school in the world are very, very powerful tools politically, if you know how to use them. And it could allow you to intervene in very difficult uh, situations, not, not only in Israel, Palestine, obviously, but all over the world. <laughs>